Welcome to the Flound Foundation for Mental Health. I'm your mental hygienist, Morgan Rector. Today we're focused on trauma with our guest, Dr. Robert T. Muller, a psychologist who specializes in the treatment of trauma. People often throw the words trauma, traumatic, or traumatized around in a cavalier or even comic fashion. For example, someone might say that that barber butchered my hair and just in time for the award ceremony. I looked terrible. I was so embarrassed. I was traumatized. Is this incidence of social embarrassment truly traumatic, or is it a classic example of someone confusing trauma with stress? Our guest knows the difference, for he is a psychologist who specializes in treating traumatized patients. He has even written a book about trauma entitled Trauma and the Struggle to Open Up, From Avoidance to Recovery and Growth, which was published in June of this year and is available in bookstores and online. If you have been struggling to cope with the after effects of trauma, Dr. Muller is the ideal specialist for you. You can find his contact information at www.thetraumatherapistproject.com. Thank you for joining us, Rob. Hi. Hi, Morgan. So first of all, take me to medical school for a moment. What is the difference between stress and trauma? Uh, graduate school? Graduate school, yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, well, okay. So interesting. Uh it, I, I was I was interested to hear that commentary um, because that's actually the very first uh, question that I ask students uh, in my graduate class on trauma. Um, I actually ask them a little bit about uh, when they have used the word traumatized or when people they know have used the word traumatized. And you're 100 percent right. People throw the label around all the time. Um, trauma is is. Uh, very different than stress and the fundamental difference is that when um, people have uh, psychological trauma they have uh, ongoing life often lifelong consequences of uh, experiences that have been overwhelming and these experiences have affected their nervous system it's affected them in terms of how they think about themselves it's affected their relationship um, these uh, experiences are often profound and uh, they uh, last for a long time. So when people have post-traumatic stress disorder, let's say from um, uh, uh, you know uh, combat or or from or from um, uh, having been um, in, a, in a terrible car accident or from uh, uh, a natural disaster. Uh, those experiences really stick with you. And interpersonal trauma is very similar as well. Uh, when people have had a betrayal of trust by someone that they care about, that the effects of that last for a long time. And people often feel, I had a patient just the other day sitting there like, what's wrong with me? Why is it that I, it, it feels like, you know, you know, the domestic violence that happened, happened three years ago. You know, what, why am I still upset about it? I'm like, oh, three years it's not that long when people have been s as, as affected by such severe domestic violence as, as that person was. So trauma, the effects, stress, of course, you know, those things, the effects are transient and, and you know, they can, it can be very, very significant, but those, that does pass when stressor passes. And I understand trauma can even alter your genetic structure to a degree. It changes the brain's chemistry or function. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in the neurobiology of trauma, but I can, I can absolutely uh, say that there are, are books about that for sure. Uh, it affects the immune system. It affects um, uh, the brain in various, in various ways. It affects um, all kinds of different psychophysiological measures, such as heart rate and... Um, uh, uh, galvanic skin response and um, uh, uh, muscle tension. So a number of psychophysiological uh, measures of, of bodily function are affected by trauma. Uh, the person ends up often with a much, um, uh, much sharper startle response. So after a traumatic incident and, and they've been affected for in a significant way, what, uh, what can happen is that um, they can actually be much jumpier and startle much more easily. They can have uh, symptoms of hyperarousability, which means uh, they get um, 
like their body tension is much higher. Their their um, uh, as I say, the psychophysiological measures their their body's moving at a much higher pace in a sense, and and uh, and stress levels ongoing are high. And when you have stress sustained for long periods of time, that affects your body and not so great ways. Yeah, absolutely. I was actually listening to an interview today with Roger Daltrey of The Who, oh. and he grew up in post-World War II London, and he said even decades later, if, his, if there was an electrical storm, his mother would grab all the kids and put them under the table because she thought we're being bombed again. Wow. This, these, their parents still had PTSD after yeah, all that yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. neat. Yeah, that's a very good example, actually, yeah. of both the arousability and then, and then, and then some of the behaviors that people people fall into when that happens oh know. sure yeah. so and one thing i've been curious about is that you know all my life i've heard the terms nervous breakdown and mental breakdown and i was kind of fascinated by how these are not in the dsm they're not classified as mental illnesses so is it is it more accurate to say these are incidents where someone um experiences a traumatic event and they're just unable to cope with it is that what that is happening or? yeah it's it's interesting the term nervous breakdown i, I still have patients who will use the term they'll say oh you know back when i had my nervous breakdown it, it's not a it's not a term that's used in the psychiatric uh, community it's a, it's a it's a it's a general term used in the population i mean different people mean different things i think uh a lot of people use the term when when they're uh, dealing with depression um people have used the term when they have anxiety disorders so they're 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 panicky and they respond very easily to anxiety and they um, have panic attacks and they can refer to that as, as being a nervous break different people use it the term somewhat differently but I think what's common and and, and also people have had tr trauma as well I think what's common is a feeling that they're not right they're not they're not feeling that they're that they're the the them that they know themselves to be kind of thing things mm. things you know things were going okay up to a at least they were managing somehow up to a certain point and now they're feeling that things have 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 gone off the rails and it's not okay and they feel they often feel embarrassed about it they often feel um that that sometimes people feel guilty coming in for help and actually will say oh you have other people have such much more significant problems than me and <laughs> these can even be people who have, you know, substantial problems and, and, and certainly, in, in a sense, deserve to, to, to seek treatment and, 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 and to get help. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I think it's, it's interesting, the, the term nervous, nervous mm -hmm. breakdown. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting one. It's, it's misnomer, yeah. I guess, right? Well, I mm -hmm. mean, it's, it's, I mean, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. we have all kinds of labels for mental health and mental illness and, you know, we, there's the term insane, and insane is oh, not yeah. is not a term that's used in the legal, you know, uh, in Canada anyway. You know, we use the term not criminally responsible. Oh, um, in the U.S., they use the term, I, I don't know if they still do. When I was training back in the day in Boston, not guilty by reason of insanity. Uh, so just a different term, but, but yeah, the term insane, like what is insane? Is it psychotic? Is it, you know, yeah. what is it? Or is it just you know, being so overwhelmed and unable to function that you're just, again, not feeling that you're, that you're right for, for who you know yourself to be. Oh, absolutely. You're, you're, you're different. And I mean, I've experienced trauma myself okay. and I'm not the same person I was when I was a child. I mean, that goes without saying we all change, but yeah. I think I lost a lot of self-esteem and it developed anxiety and depression. I'm just not the same confident person I was, you know, and I mourn okay. the loss okay. of that person. You right. can feel like a, per a version of you died, you know. Mm -hmm. and, you know. Yeah, and that's yeah. that's actually very that is an actu actually a central piece of trauma recovery mm -hmm. is grieving loss of aspects of yourself. Um, not to say that you know you're never coming back and you're never going to be happy again and you're never going to be because that's not true. People do recover from trauma. People do find a way to cope with their overwhelming life experiences, but it does change people trauma does change people and you might have you may have to many people have to mourn the loss mm -hmm. of aspects of themselves sometimes it's a loss of innocence sometimes mm -hmm. people mourn you know they experience trauma and they they didn't you know prior to that they maybe thought that people were a certain way 
and now they understand that no people aren't always that way and and they've seen a dark aspect of life that they hadn't seen before and there's a loss of innocence and they have to mourn that loss because there's something you know lovely when you're a little kid and you can and you have that innocence mm-hmm. um there, there's something very precious about that it is a big loss especially when kids when kids are traumatized for sure but even as an adult you know you you, you lose a certain kind of uh, sense of the world as a, as a certain kind of place maybe a fair place or a you know whatever there are various kinds of aspects of people but but losing that parts of yourself um that's that's an important part of trauma recovery but being willing to mourn that loss yeah uh, well one passage of your book that was very memorable for me was this young man whose mother told him that when she was pregnant with him she would jump up and down as an effort to try to abort him yeah i can i can't even imagine how traumatic it would be to have your mother say that to you and uh he he started to joke about it that was his coping mechanism but yet it seemed, it, I guess that kind of corrupted him in the sense that he came to believe, well, you should just be able to laugh at these things that are incredibly hurtful to do, hurtful yeah. to say. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's the case of Nicholas in chapter two. It's it's a, um, so exactly. So he used his humor. It's so interesting. Humor is such an interesting thing in trauma because you have people who use humor as a way of managing. And it's it's not a bad thing, actually. Yeah. Um, there is truth to laugh in the world will laugh with you. There is, you know, there is there's a reason that people um, engage in gallows humor. You know, it's things are dark, things are sad, things are difficult, and you make a joke about it, and it does cut that stress. and And it's it's not a bad thing. Um, I think I think humor can be a really productive um, coping strategy when people have, have had traumatic events. However. Where it can be difficult is where it, when it becomes so limiting that that's all you can do. Mm-hmm. You know, you just become, you know, Judy Jokester. You, you know, like no matter what happens, everything's a big joke. And you're not able to sort of sit with difficult feelings. That's a, that's a difficult thing in terms of, you know, that, that limits you from uh, in, in, in terms of engaging in intimate relationships. Oh, yeah. It limits you in parenting. You know, your child is upset and you, you kind of joke about it or laugh it off and then that child doesn't feel like mom or dad gets it you know so they're, they're like a lot of ways in which it's, it's very limiting you know it's it's a double-edged sword humor you know and how incredibly awkward that must have been for you during that session think i really shouldn't laugh at this and yet maybe he wants me to and i don't want to alienate him that must he, have been a strange dance for you to do exactly mm-hmm. exactly I, yeah i talk i talk about it was, it was kind of like um uh uh, it took me it took me by surprise that he was sort of chuckling about this, and even though I found it weird and sad and and distressing, I kind of smiled with him because I think that's a very human response. If someone's laughing hard at something, you kind of kind of uh, you laugh with them. Um, but then afterwards, it, it kind of made me realize that I was kind of drawn into this this lighthearted way of being that that he presented the, himself to the world with. Um, uh, and and so yeah. Then afterwards, I sort of thought about it and thought, gosh, yeah. I wonder if he, I wonder if he does that a lot with people. You know, I think I, I suspected he did at the time. Yeah. Yeah, comedy was the way in which I coped for many years, and oh. sometimes the only uh, source of uh, the only thing that made me smile for a long time that oh. helped get me through a lot of hard times. Oh, right. Okay. I, I guess when you look at it from, through the um, the lens of evolutionary psychology, maybe we developed that as a way to avoid breaking down you know we got to find a way to get through this emotionally you know yeah yeah i think i think so yeah for sure for sure i mean like yeah you have to find ways to cope therapy can help you find other ways you know more you know maybe broad broaden those coping mechanisms but yeah i mean it's 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 very hard when you've when you haven't had many ways of coping and you haven't been taught many ways of coping and you've also been taught let's say in many of these families to stuff your feelings you know like if you like just uh, just two days ago I had a client tell me that when she would cry um, she would get punished for it um, literally oh. spanked and it was you know, you know sort of the I'll give you something to cry about w- would be what her parents would say and I heard that that's line, a problem yeah, yeah. Well, by the way, listeners, there's a reggae play- band playing outside the space where we're recording. Hopefully it doesn't enter into the mic. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so I noticed one thing you wrote about, too, is getting the timing right in terms of addressing trauma 
it can be too soon, it can, we can wait too long. You once mentioned, um, I think it was an intern or someone that you were uh, mentoring, and he was just in such a hurry to get them to open up about trauma. And then right. because he was pushing them, they felt distressed by that, and they just backed out. And I remember being a child and my mother bringing me to therapy, and I didn't want to talk about it. I hated therapy, and that she just ended it. Um, and the whole issue, whether or not to counsel children, maybe that's debatable. But uh, I think if the patient's not ready, maybe they shouldn't move forward. What do you think about that? Do you think you have to address it right away? Or if the person's not ready, should they do it in their time? Well, that's a, that's a great question and, and another central point of, of in my book, Trauma and the Struggle to Open Up. It's a struggle to open up. Absolutely. It's yeah. not... It's not an easy thing. And when people go, when people have um, crit critical incidents debriefing right after a traumatic event, some people respond well to that and some people don't like it. And it's really important that if someone goes through, let's say, like a, in Toronto, there was a, a shooting uh, and various, well, there were several shootings, but mm. there, was, there was some horrible, uh, horrible one uh, uh, just a, uh, about a month ago. And and um, and and many people, you know, were, were were quite traumatized by it. You know, if if you would have had a, a someone uh, come in and say, okay, now you need to talk about this, well, some people don't want to at that; they're not ready. And so, in therapy, in trauma therapy, it's central to it's very important to pace the process of opening up. Um, people need to be given space to be able to open up at their own time. You know, it's it's you know on their own. On their own time, and and if they if if it's pushed too quickly, then people will feel overwhelmed. People will feel um, kind of like you know they'll feel stupid. Like what's wrong with me that I can't deal with this? But they they can't deal with it just yet. At the same time, so um, back in the day in the in the nineties, there was a, a a period where a lot of trauma therapists got into a lot of trouble because they were pushing clients to open up too quickly and they were making suggestions to them about their past and so then what happened in therapy from through the 2000s and until really maybe about five years ago trauma therapists tended to say okay well you don't ask people anything you just let them open up when they're ready the problem with that is that many of them would never get ready and they wouldn't open up at all and so there are techniques for helping people gradually feel more comfortable with opening up and the main thing is building the therapeutic relationship so this is this is more for therapists i won't i won't because i know most of your listeners are not therapists but even if you're going to therapy and you're thinking about this or you're thinking about going to therapy you have to build the trust in the relationship as that gradually builds and there is that sense of trust there, then it is helpful actually for people to begin to open up and talk about their trauma. And, and actually that is in fact what helps people uh, eventually come to be able to address it more directly, to face it, not to be plagued by it. So it's a process of pacing at the level that the client the person can bear, but you know, through building trust in the relationship. That's that's key. Yeah, the challenging thing for the patient, as you mentioned in the book and as and as I know personally, is that opening up about the trauma in therapy means being vulnerable, being vulnerable all over again in reference to particular events. And, uh, and I remember feeling like I have to address this, that's why I'm here, but I also feel like I'm dragging myself kicking and screaming into that situation. So yeah, it's it is really hard to, to open up, as you said. It's a struggle, and and uh, you're really uh, at war with yourself to open up again. Yeah, yeah it, it it is it, it is, and 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 people really and quite literally, um, pe people people. Well, well, I have cl clients say, I'm a, a, you know, you say at war with yourself. Um, sometimes therapists talk about you know part of me wants this but part of me wants that and I, I literally I, again very recently I had a client talk about how um, part of her really wanted to talk about um, I, I, um, it, it had to do with a, a struggle around her um, uh, uh, relationship that there was there was some really 
you know, negative stuff. I won't go into detail. I'll just say it was some very, very negative stuff in her relationship. Part of her really wanted to tell me, but part of her just held. And I said to her, let me, I, what I said to her there at that moment, because we had just started therapy. It had just been a few weeks. I said, let me hear in detail from that part of you that doesn't want to tell me about it. What's it saying to you? And so, and so she said, well, it's saying, you know, your problems aren't important. Or well, another thing she said it was saying is, um, uh, you know, don't don't waste his time. These are stupid issues. And so I said, okay, that's really important. I want you this week to write down the different things that that part of you is telling about why not to talk about it. And then and then we'll talk about it next week. Now, why did I do that? Because I wanted to give her permission for that part of her that's really afraid to express itself. That actually built enough trust that just a, a couple weeks later, she was able to actually go into more actual detail about what happened to her because she felt that trust with me she didn't feel pressured by me and so that's that's a technique that really can be very helpful with people who are really struggling with well what do i do here with these overwhelming feelings yeah i guess there is quite a bit of cognitive dissonance isn't there and like two lanes of traffic one's got an exit ramp and you could just avoid it all together exactly the other one you could, the other one you could just keep on going and it's a struggle to decide which direction to go in. Yeah. Right. And that's why people use avoidance strategies. Mm -hmm. One of the big things with trauma is avoidance um, uh, strategies. So, you know, what are avoidance strategies? Well, people will do things like they'll drink or they'll, they'll gamble or they'll, they'll uh, turn to uh, sexual addiction or, 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 or food addictions or, you know, various sorts of things. Or, or they will, um, you know, they'll, they'll, have, they'll get into, into arguments about trivial matters that don't relate to what's really going on for them because they're avoiding the deeper stuff. And uh, that's something I, I, I see a lot with people. People can engage in avoidance behaviors for years, mm -hmm. years and years. And why, uh, uh, oops, why do they do that? Because it works. It works temporarily. Mm -hmm. It's not a permanent fix, but it works for a while anyway. Oh, absolutely. You know? So uh, let's go from avoidance to resolution. Um, what do you find is a common denominator in terms of people having breakthroughs in their trauma therapy um I, I mean maybe you can't wipe the slate clean entirely but when they get to that point where now they can cope with it now they can move on with their lives and they can get over anxiety and depression whatever is getting in their way what do you find people what do you find happens that brings people to that point okay excellent question so the, the language i like to use regarding trauma recovery is people the wish when people come into therapy is I want to just get over it. Like if they could leapfrog over it and just cut out this thing from their life, they would be very happy to do like, that. Like you're a magician saying the magic words, right? A hundred percent. hundred percent. But that isn't actually how trauma therapy works. When people come to a place through gradually talking about it, thinking about the meaning of these different events in their life, thinking about... Um, themselves and what they've been through and the losses they've experienced and the things the the aspects of life that they've had to mourn the loss of as they come through the process what they end up with is living alongside the trauma the trauma doesn't go away magically it doesn't it doesn't become something they've forgotten about but what it does become is something that doesn't continue to haunt them daily it's something that they can you know, when they need to think about it or when they're when they or when something comes up that reminds them of it, they do think about it, but it doesn't then. And it's not a pleasant memory by any stretch. It's 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 it can still be awful, but awful doesn't mean debilitating mm -hmm. is a big difference between a, an awful memory, a memory that you think about and it it it's really bad. You really hate that thing or you hate that experience of your life or you hate the way you related at that time in your life or you hate the choices you made why did I do that why did I you know why did I do that why did I make that choice when that happened you know or, so, you, so you get angry at aspects of yourself it's a different thing to dislike that aspect of life 
versus to be debilitated by it. And so when people come to recover from trauma therapy, they come to live alongside the trauma. It's not something they're happy about, this aspect of their life, this chapter, but it's just a chapter. They've got a life with whatever it is, you know, dozens and dozens of chapters. The trauma is a chapter. They can open it, look at it. They can close it, and they've got other chapters, and it doesn't define them anymore. It's, it's part of their identity, but it's not all of their identity. That's that's where people really come to a good place. And I suspect recovery. a lot of people start therapy disappointed to find out they have to do work, right? They don't want to do anything. Ooh. They yeah, they just want you to somehow fix it and clean up the mess, but then they find out well it's like I had a, a, a therapist recommend to me to keep a journal and all this kind of stuff. Right. A lot of people don't want to have to do the work, right? They want it to be it's, easy. I know. It's it's and it is hard work and mm-hmm. it's and it's so unfair. I mean Especially if you've had interpersonal trauma. Well, really all, I mean, you know, but interpersonal trauma where people feel, you know, hey, I trusted someone. Let's say it's a domestic violence situation, rape or um, um, physical abuse by a parent. You trusted that individual, the attachment figure, if it's a parent or, or the love interest, if it's, if it's a, a partner. You trusted them to, to behave in a certain way. And they betrayed that trust. Mm-hmm. And so then you're left with feeling feelings like, um, you know, I, can I trust men anymore? Can I trust women anymore? You know, can, can I trust myself in relationships anymore? Um, uh, those sorts of feelings are very, very painful feelings. And then you've got to do the work. Mm-hmm. And, and like here you've been through so much and now you have to do the work. That's really unfair. But nevertheless, it is in fact the case, and I think uh, you know you, you say it well when when you, when you describe it that way. It is, it is the client who has to actually do the work to be able to reach the point of of recovery. Um, you know, with the help of people. I mean, part of um, another thing with trauma is that people try to deal with it alone for so long. They um, they're trying to uh, to manage, and they feel they can't trust anybody, and then they take this risk. In therapy, or maybe with someone who's a good person, who, who a good a, a new relationship that's a good relationship, a healing relationship, and they start to trust again, and and they and then they start to see, okay, um, you know, uh, this can be a you know what we call in the business a corrective emotional experience, where a new relationship that's a healing relationship can help shift things a little bit for people and start to feel that no not all relationships are bad and no not all people will treat you with with you know with hurt some will and you mm-hmm. you want to be careful and be thoughtful about who you can and can't trust but that doesn't mean you can't trust anybody in fact so you know that kind of thing is is part of the work is Yes, it's work on your own, and yes, yes, you have to do the work, but you you want to do it in the context of a healing relationship. Sure. So you 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 can get help. You can seek help. That's a really important piece. Sure. Um, I don't know if there are any statistics on this, but what I'm wondering is, uh, do you think uh, what do you think is more common, a trauma-free life or a life with at least one traumatic incident? Ooh. Okay. Yeah. So um, so when we t- so if we talk about d- well, here's the thing. It comes down to what are you defining as trauma? So, mm-hmm. you know, if we use a very broad definition, then, of course, you know, there, I, I think you're going to have people who say, yes, everybody's had trauma. But if you use a more narrow definition, and by narrow I mean a life experience that is debilitating, that 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 you think about, that leads to nightmares, that leads to... Uh, flashbacks that leads to avoidance. You know, I, I don't go to that part of the city anymore because you know who knows what can happen. That leads to um, uh, um, hyperarousability. You know, um, kind of symptoms of of, of arou- You know, where your your body's way too aroused in, in, in the sense of of your heart rate and and your your muscle tension. If we use that more narrow definition of trauma, then no, most people have not had a, a traumatic event. People have had stressful events, and psychotherapy is very helpful mm-hmm. for people who've had stressful events or depression or anxiety or eating disorders or all kinds of things. But if we're talking about trauma in the sense of like post-traumatic stress disorder kind of thing, then uh, you know the the incidence in the population of people who've had 
some kind of relational abuse is something between 10 and 20 percent. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. that's roughly what it would, would, would be. So people have had physical abuse or sexual abuse or severe verbal abuse. It's about 10 to 20 percent. Now, I just, when I say that, I don't want to dismiss the feelings of people who have been through a lot but haven't been debilitated. It's not like your experiences don't count. Sure, yeah. One of the points that I make in the book is there's no hierarchy of suffering. You know, it, you know, it, it doesn't make sense to say, you know, you suff- I suffered more than you, so your suffering doesn't count. We don't know what will be traumatic for any one person. And, and in the book, I, I give an example in Chapter 5, the, the case of a, a woman named Robin. Uh, you know, that's the, the name I give her in the book, um, who was deeply depressed and and had been traumatized as a young girl by the um, by uh, by the suicide of her father, but what she came into therapy with was not actually the suicide of her father. It was when her dog died, mm-hmm. and triggered yeah. it. W- and it yeah. triggered her, but it triggered her boy like like nobody's business. And it and it was a traumatic event in its own right to her. So. It's nobody's, nobody can tell you your traumatic, you know, y- you didn't have a traumatic event. Like, it's, up, it's a subjective experience. So as I say, 10 to 20% are debilitated. It's, it's a definition that people have to make for themselves as to whether or not they feel that a particular event was traumatic. And nobody can really say to you, you know, stop, you know, stop feeling that way or you're wrong. So it, it, it's a, it's, you know, you, you want to be mindful of that because sometimes we get into um, people comparing suffering, you know, and I, I find that that's always a tricky sort of thing when people do that. Well, I think if they would say something like that, they don't understand trauma. They have never experienced trauma. I think people who've experienced it know the difference instinctively, probably. Right. For sure. I think that's true. So right now we're going to go to a commercial break, and afterwards we're going to be back with a segment called This Crazy Planet. Taking It, a podcast where I will interview friends, family, and a bunch of strangers along the way who have stellar life experiences and stories to share. I'm your host, Liz Hodson. I'm a filmmaker, photographer, personal support worker, writer, and a whole bunch of other things. And now a podcaster. This podcast is called Faking It. And that's because I feel like that's what we're all doing. Faking it till we figure it out. Till we make it. Because nobody really has a damn clue what they're doing. Life changed a lot for me when I realized that. And we're back. So uh, right now, uh, it's been a week since the Pittsburgh shooting at that synagogue. It's been 19 years since the Columbine shootings. There's all these spree killings that have been going on. Started in schools. Now they're happening in shopping malls, religious institutions. They're happening with more frequency. It was mostly in the States at first. Now we're having them here in Canada and in other parts of the world. Um, And the killers, they give uh, motives that vary in, uh, you know, in subject matter. But uh, I'm wondering, what do you think is behind the phenomenon? Why has this been happening so much? Oh gosh! If I if I had the answer to that question, but let me, but I can reflect on it. I mean, I sure. certainly don't have an answer or profess to have the answer. But I will say, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned the Pittsburgh Pittsburgh shooting. So I'm Jewish, mm-hmm. and um, uh, I talk about that in in, in the book because it because it's it's relevant in terms of my own my own history. My my uh, father's father was m- was murdered in the Holocaust, actually, and. My father, to a very large extent, I would say it affected him. Um, you know, he he lost his childhood because of because of that. Um, you know, when he was you know uh, about uh, uh, ten years old, after they found out that his father was killed, um, after the war was over. So my my dad was was about ten at that time. About a year or two after that, he actually had to go to work because there wasn't enough money in the household. So as a little kid, he got a trade, and he had to. He became an upholsterer, and so he was a, a, a kid, you know, thirteen-year-old kid doing upholstery, making money for the family. His mom worked at a butcher shop, and they were living hand to hand to mouth, um, and and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I won't go into into all the details about my 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 dad's life and and my mom's life as well. Who also she also lived through the Holocaust. She was also Jewish and. And was a little girl. She was actually seven, and and was in hiding, separated from from her parents for months. 
So the issue of anti-Semitism is very important to me. And I, I don't want to make this all about anti-Semitism. I'll just say that I, I, I think that there is a global rise in fascism. Um, anti-Semitism is, is, is a piece of that. I, mean, I, I don't think it's the only piece by any stretch. I think there is a global rise in fascism that, that is really worrying me. I mean, I, I think about the, um, the recent election in Brazil of, yeah. a, of, a, of, a, of a, 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 I forget his, uh, his name, but he's, uh, you know, I read in several articles, he's quoted as having said a number of things that, that sound oof, very worrisome in terms of the potential for, for fascism in that, in that country. Um, but then so many other parts of the world, the Philippines and um, in Turkey and uh, you know, man, many other parts of the world where there's a, a Poland, there's a real, an, and Hungary actually where my, where my parents grew up, there's a global rise in fascism, anti-Semitism goes with that, but also Islamophobia and other forms of, 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 dis of terrible discrimination and racism. And it's worrisome. I, I, I don't have an answer to that, but I, I, I will say that um, uh, my, my patients are... are you know, worried about it. I, I mm -hmm. have people coming in and 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 very er nervous about about this trend. And in Toronto, where there was a, a shooting, uh, was it a shooting on Davenport or was it on Danforth? Yeah, on Danforth. I'm and so I, sorry. I live right around the corner from yeah. it. And it just feels like now it could happen anywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. And it's a it's a be it's a wonderful neighborhood. It's mm -hmm. yeah, I, sure. I, that's that's the Greek uh, yeah. Greek food neighbor. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, and it's it's just it's it's really distressing. I mean, to to see this, to see this uh, rise in 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 this in this kind of violence is very scary. And in and in terms of mental health stigma, I think a lot of people assume uh, they hear mental illness, they think, oh, is this person someone who could harm me? Um, but the thing is, at least when it comes to bigotry. It, Evil's not a mental illness. It's just a, a bad philosophy, right? It's, I mean, yeah. pe people who have mental illness are no more likely to harm people than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And there's there's all kinds of research on this. This has been shown over and over again. I mean, I don't know how many times they need to show the same thing, but it has been shown multiple times. It's not about mental illness mm -hmm. um, in terms of people who have mental illness most of the time if they're going to harm anybody, what they're at risk for is harming themselves. I mean, sure. that's and when people have a trauma history. That's what I worry about. And they're it's also more likely to become victims of violent crimes. And more likely because mm -hmm. um, the path is a pretty straightforward one. People who have mental illness often have lower self-esteem because they've been taught, you know, negative things about themselves. That's part of why they're struggling with depression. They've taught really crummy messages about themselves. Uh, that's been reinforced through the years. They have lower self-esteem. And if someone is going to prey on somebody, that person who's going to prey on people, they're going to prey on people who have low self-esteem. So there is a correlation there. And, and, and the path is quite clear that, that if anything, um, people who have mental illness are more likely to be victims of crime, victims of violence, victims of trauma. Um, people, sexual abuse survivors are much more likely to be sexually abused um, multiple times and again it's the, the the issue is because the low self-esteem makes them more likely to be seen uh, by predatory individuals as, as a potential target and that's why therapy is important for people who have that low self-esteem to learn things like when, if, when they have a trauma history to learn things like assertiveness skills to learn things like taking self-care to learn things like how to keep yourself safe um, there, and there are many strategies that, that are really important in trauma therapy for, for people like that. But the other thing I want to say about people who are schizophrenics, people often worry, oh, you know, schizo you know they're, they're not any no. more dangerous in terms of violence than anybody else. Again, if they're going to be at risk for something, schizophrenics are, risk, are, excuse me, are at risk for homelessness. Yeah. That's actually what they're at risk for. So, yeah, so we, we just want to kind of be careful about that when people make grand sweeping statements about mental illness. Oh, sure. It's like imagine imagine if you had to live with schizophrenia, you'd be suffering a lot more than uh, you would from their illness. Exactly. You know, having to listen to voices in your head telling you terrible things, it's, <clears throat> you know, it'd be awful. 100%. Yeah. And uh, as far as vulnerability goes, as someone who's had a chronic problem with anxiety myself, it, it can make you feel raw. That's where the vulnerability comes in. You right. you lose your strength in some situations. And I think that's maybe where the violent crime comes because sometimes you attract people who are domineering or aggressive. And, and so I think absolutely 
We're yeah. more likely to become victims more than aggressors. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Now, here's a question you may have gotten a lot. Uh, Donald Trump's personality, what's your diagnosis of that? Oh, boy. <laughs> Narcissist? <laughs> my, my, well, I mean, I, I think anybody... It, it's that's self-evident, um, mm-hmm. but I mean, in all in all fairness, my um, my profession says we're not supposed to diagnose people from a distance, and oh, I think I and I th- well, yeah. I mean, I think I think that's fair because in reality, you never really know um, what's going on inside someone. But but uh, you know the the level of the level of arrogance. If if, we, if, if I get away from from um, DSM language for a moment is 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 just um, mind boggling. I mean, don't get me started on that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, if yeah, we can do a little bit, but I mean, it's it's I, it, yeah, it's it's. I mean, I one thing that I I, I feel very sad about um, that relates to mental health with with uh, the American administration now is um uh, transgender people mm-hmm. and how they're being uh vilified you know and cast cast aside and uh you know i mean it's 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 interesting i i i've seen such a transformation culturally uh in the last 5 years and it's it's been a positive one i th- i think for people who struggle with with gender identity and or or who don't struggle with it and have a gender identity have something to say and then they're being told no you don't you you know your what you're feeling and thinking about yourself is not what you should be thinking and feeling about yourself, and so that's something that I feel quite sad about for for uh, for those individuals. Yeah, um, there seems to be an epidemic of uh, poor mental health outcomes among young people right now. Uh, low self esteem is one, and anxiety and depression. Uh, there are a lot of organizations at colleges and universities now where they offer counseling to young people, uh, gay and transgender yeah, people are yeah. included. Um, a lot of young men are, are unemployed and, and depressed, and uh, I guess maybe it has to do with the economy, too. Their fu- futures look incredibly bleak. Um, yeah, how, how do you account for this? seems like a pandemic of uh, mental illness. Now. I, I, I do think, I mean, so my kids are, my kids are uh, uh, 22, my boys are almost 23, my daughter's 24. I have twin boys who are 23, and my daughter's 25. And it's interesting hearing them talk about they're they're I mean they're confident ha- happy kids as far as as far as I can tell thank, thank goodness and and um, so you know I'm not you know I don't have uh, you know severe worries about them but but I do worry about things like you know when they say you know you know I, I don't know if I'm ever going to own a house you know I don't I don't know if I'm ever going to you know be able to save for my retirement you know like, you know these kind of concerns are interesting to hear well we're you know worrisome but I think they're a sign of what a lot of young people are feeling, sort of, uh, you know, they look to, they look at the baby boomer generation who financially had it very good. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm I'm not quite a baby boomer, but I'm just at the tail end of it. So I'm I was born in '64, um, uh, and you know I was I'd say myself included, you know, have have benefited from in many ways, you know, a p- pretty good pretty favorable job situation, pr- pretty favorable, you know, um, retirement plan for my university, you know, et cetera, that sort of thing. I think a lot of young people who are facing cont- contractual work, that that's what they can find, even even with some education, um, it's it's difficult. And I think I think it's hard for many of them not to feel a little bit jaded and, and cynical about whether or not they really do have a, a stable, you know, financial future. And I think also... My, my kids for sure you know worry about the environment you know my, my you know my kids I, I, as, I, as I mentioned they're in their early 20s you know what you know they're thinking about you know well when when I you know when I have a grandchild is you know what parts of the world are going to be in, in you know habitable right I mean yeah, some exactly. you know uh, we're already see- so I think this is you know the kind of worries that I'm seeing anyway in 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 the young people I know and I teach a lot of university students I I teach uh, undergraduates as well as graduate students at, at, at uh, York University and um, for sure you know the undergraduates I, I speak to they they do share many of these worries well yeah I mean and I think one thing that contributes to it as well, and it's it's affected me. I'm 41, but I've heard a lot of baby boomers criticize younger people, saying, "What, you know, why they're living at home at the age of 25 and all this stuff." And well, it's like, well, they're, they all they've been able to find is minimum wage. 
Many of them have university educations, and they're still working in the service industry. Um, I don't know if I'd ever be able to afford a, a, a house or to retire. I don't know. Sometimes I wonder if retire is going to become retirement is going to be a luxury in the future. But yeah, the future does look kind of grim right now. Yeah. I mean, I think when you when you talk about um, uh, yes, yes, I, I I agree that that is a, a feeling that many 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 people have. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's a concern. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I mean, right now there is a big clash between actually those older generations and the younger generations. I was, uh, yeah, I was, I was thinking that, you know, I, I often get my colleagues saying things like the yeah, kind of kids today stuff. I, I, think, I think since time immemorial people have been saying kids today that, you know, and, and I think, you know, I, I, don't, I see undergraduate students being every bit as, um, you know, uh, taking, taking their work seriously, every bit as – Every bit as hard working as as what I saw when I was an undergraduate. I I don't think, I don't think I don't I don't buy the, you know, millennials are such and such uh, lazy or whatever. I, I I don't I don't I don't buy that. I, I I think that it's hard to be optimistic when you have a bleaker economic future, um, and I think you have to be creative. And I think they and they, I think they're they're they are and finding other ways to make money. But I th- it's hard. And and I think living at home, if living at home is what you need to do, and if getting help from your parents is what you need, you know, I think this is what a lot of people are needing to turn to because the economic pressure is, um, you know, demanded, I think. Yeah, and I think, I wonder if our society has been irresponsible in the sense of not treating mental illness enough because I, I know in the United States they lose $90 billion uh, worth of productivity every year that's the impact it makes on the economy and of course a lot of crime a lot of homelessness and uh, poverty can be attributed to uh, poor mental health outcomes and uh, so it seems like it's actually very practical to subsidize mental health care I just but when is it going to happen you know? I know yeah. I, I, I agree and and uh, when I was a grad student and I, I, I cannot remember which journal and when it was published but when I was a grad student there was a very good study that was done comparing the costs so this is now 30 well more than how old am I 54 yeah like 30 years ago um uh looking at um cost of um outpatient psychotherapy and the cost of outpatient psychotherapy which you know even if you paid full fees to a psychiatrist or psychologist you know if, if you if don't even don't even think about reduced fees full fees to a, psychi- a psychiatrist or a psychologist for like 2 years of therapy the cost was substantially less than uh, an inpatient hospital stay. Absolutely. And so then there were these insurance companies that were paying for, well, we won't pay for psychotherapy. We'll pay for six sessions. We'll pay for five sessions. We'll pay for two sessions. I mean, this is what they, and, but we will pay if you, you know, become suicidal. Well, two days of being suicidal and being in an ER can pay for a year of psychotherapy. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's just completely nonsensical um, to be to be skimping on mental health mental health and so I, I, I if I remember correctly there was something in the title about mental health is a good economic investment absolutely so the article wasn't just okay let's let's feel bad I mean sure we should have, we have a moral and ethical obligation but even if you don't even if you don't buy that buy the economic arguments that that it's actually financially in in our in our society's best interest to put money into mental health. Well, yeah, like one one of my future guests has schizophrenia, and uh, he once spent, I think it was like three months in prison. Well, you have to pay for the police resources, the court's resources, the legal aid lawyer, the prison's resources. If all that money had been allocated instead to mental health care, it could have prevented it, and it would have been less money involved, really. A hundred percent. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. And, and we do, one of the things that really bugs my wife and I, my wife is a child psychiatrist, so we're both in the business, is uh, when we hear government announcements of, you know, we've got this program to help, you know, um, to help such and such, often it's child children's mental health. What you often don't see is that, you know, a month after that announcement, so you name it, this has been done by the liberal governments, this has been done by conservative governments, this is just 
over and over again. We see this announcement, lots of fanfare, lots of excitement, lots of uh, interviews on the radio. Then three weeks later, the budget gets cut. Then two months later, it it dies. You know, whatever bill was being proposed died, and then it, and, or then it's retracted, or then the next government comes in and they pull it. And we, we don't have, I mean, it's a sustained effort financially in terms of investment in mental health. There is no, certainly not from government to government, but even within governments, we don't see a consistent kind of effort toward really putting a good, good uh, investment into mental health care. Just one photo op after another, right? Uh, it's yeah. a fo- it is yeah. photo op. It, it makes for great, you know, we're going to help children who have depression. We don't want children to kill themselves. Well, yeah. Who no does. kidding. We <laughs> yeah. don't want children to go. But now you have to put your money where your mouth is kind of thing. The thing about trauma, too, uh, and I won't speak for anyone else, but, I mean, it didn't catch up with me until I was in my teens. So I don't know how 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 it is with most, most children, small children. I don't know if they start to feel the effects immediately, but it seems like sometimes, yeah, it doesn't catch up with you until later on. So why can't we have care for everybody, adults and adolescents and children? Make yeah, it sense. does. It often doesn't catch up with with you until mm-hmm. later on. Um, people often don't realize that there's something wrong until later. Children who have, if, if children are sexually abused, y- you can't. You know, if you look back on photographs of them around the time and then soon afterwards, and you look at those pictures, you can see that if they're smiling, it's a smile plastered on their face. It's yeah. not an authentic smile. You can see that often they're more disheveled. They're they're, you know, you can see that their grades go down. Oh, so if, yeah. you, if you're paying attention, um, you know, then you can start seeing it. You can see, oh, you see it with teenagers, you know, where they're like, so let's say it's a you know, 11, 12 year old. All of a sudden this, you know, quote, good child is now acting out in school. Well, what's going on? What's going on that this child is acting out now? Or what's going on that this child is, you know, seeing the child has marks on their arms. They're cutting themselves. What's going on here? So are, are people paying attention to this? But yes, you don't, you, the effects don't happen right away. So you could have a, a little kid who, ha, who has been traumatized in some way, and then you don't see it kind of, you don't see it kind of being loudly proclaimed until that child is, is maybe a teenager or, or a young adult and they're, and they're off track developmentally or something like that. And unfortunately, then it may be too late. Some, they may take their own life or become addicted to drugs. And uh, Yeah, well, yeah. It, 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 that would, that's very unfortunate. And if they, but if, mm-hmm. they, if they have family members or friends who say, hey, you know, this, you know you, you've, you're going too far with this addiction, you need help. It's very important for family members to be willing to encourage. You can't force anybody to do therapy, oh, but yeah. you can invite them to. You can sure. encourage them to. You can do readings. You can give them readings. You can say, hey, this thing, you're st- whether it's depression or whatever, in response to trauma or anxiety or various kinds of symptoms or eating disorders are very common mm-hmm. among people, you know, a- anorexia or bulimia. Uh, very common responses to uh, interpersonal trauma, you know, seeing that and not judging them, but but lovingly and caringly, but emphatically letting them know that there's help available. That is such a gift. Oh, and, absolutely. And when people say, oh, I don't want to, you know, step on, you know, I don't want to overstep my bounds. You know what? Take the risk of overstepping the bounds a bit. I mean, it's better to say to somebody, I really think you need help. Make those options known. Yeah. yeah, Like you mentioned in your book, the boy who was sexually abused by a choir master, and they they were really unable to decide how to deal with it. But you really have to say to someone like that, what happened to you was wrong, and if when you're ready to deal with it, we'll, we'll we'll arrange therapy for you. But you do have to say that in the beginning, it seems to me, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you do, you do. I mean, it's and 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 again, we we can't force people, but but when people are told by enough friends and and they've had enough sort of setbacks, and they realize, you know what, this this addiction or this um, cutting or eating disorder is not ultimately helping me. I really need to seek help for some of that stuff that I went through. Um, that can be a, such a such a growthful experience. Um, sometimes it is years later. Oh, absolutely. And that was Robert T. Muller, and his book, once again, is Trauma and the Struggle to Open Up, From Avoidance to Recovery and Growth. And uh, where can we find your book, Robert? I think it's pretty much available on Amazon, and um, it's in uh, hardcover or Kindle. 
That's right. And is it, is it going to be out as an audio book eventually, do you think? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I don't think so. Don't okay. Think so. Well, it's an excellent resource for therapists and patients alike. I know I understand a lot more about trauma myself having read it. So I'll go get that book now. And thank you very much for joining us. This is Morgan Rector for the Flown Foundation for Mental Health.